Good morning and welcome to this conversation that I'm really excited about, speaking to John Doerr and Ryan Panchadsaram, apologies Ryan, um, getting my teeth in, I will get there. Um, Co-authors of Speed to Scale, an action plan for solving our climate crisis now, and also John Cleary, you're also the chair of Kleiner Perkins as well. Um, I'm really keen to explore some of the key points in your book. We've only got 15 minutes, so I'm going to leap right in. Um, coming up with an actionable plan to solve the climate crisis and decarbonize the global economy clearly is the biggest challenge facing humanity today, and one that is taxing many of the most brilliant minds globally. Um, and now you've presented one. So I guess the question is, what is the plan? And how's your plan different? Well, let me tell you how we got to this plan, because it was 15 years ago after I saw Al Gore's documentary that I turned to my daughter, Mary, and asked her, what does she think? She was 15 years old at the time. She said, Dad, I'm scared and I'm angry. Your generation created this problem. You better fix it. And I was speechless. I didn't know what to say. But what I know now is we're on the verge of irreversible, catastrophic climate crisis. And we need goals. We need action. But more than anything else, we need a plan, a plan that's clear, pragmatic, and one that we can act on immediately. And so that led Ryan and me working with 100 experts, scientists, activists, policymakers, impassioned youth to develop the speed and scale plan. And it has six big goals. If you'll permit me, uh, they all fit on a single page. The first is to electrify transportation, to stop using diesel and gasoline for our vehicles. The second, to decarbonize the grid. That's essential, or the first is useless. So use wind and solar. The third is to fix our food systems. Both modify what we eat towards more meatless proteins and dairy, but also how we grow our food and deal with food waste. The fourth, to protect nature, our oceans, our, our lands. The fifth, clean up industry, how we make cement and steel. And then the sixth, perhaps the hardest, is to remove the stubborn remaining carbon, the emissions that we will not be able to get to net zero by 2050. And as you yourself said, this is the decisive decade. We need to get halfway there by 2030. That's the plan, six big solutions. But we've got to do all this at once. So the question for my partner, Ryan, is how can we be sure we do this in time? Yeah, we, uh, we have to move quicker, right? If you do those six objectives, you draw down to zero, but it may take all the way to 2070 or 2080. So the real question is how do you move quicker and faster? And so on this uh, one pager, <laughs> you have the four accelerants, right? There is the fact that we need to win the policy and politics. We're here at COP. It's so important that countries make commitments, Rianne Marie, and they follow through with them. The second lever we have is being able to turn movements into action. So not just at the ballot boxes, but in the corporate boardroom, people have to say this is an important issue and that they want to act on them. And then we've got to invest. And then we've also got to innovate. We have to innovate to drive down the cost of green technologies. And we have to invest because it's the clear theme of this event here. Because without investment, these things don't come to life. They don't actually get deployed. And so with these four accelerants, we not only get to net zero, but we gifty. Let me add one more thing about this plan. For each of these big objectives, in the best spirit of OKRs, there are three, a handful, three to five key results that are time bound, concrete, measurable. And they allow us to track our progress, to know if we're on track for the decisive decade or, or even for the goals of the very next year. All of these objectives and key results are available in this plan on a single page at speedandscale.com. Fantastic. Well, what's measured gets done, right? That's the important thing of us moving from commitments into action. Exactly. Um, it's a bit of a cheat to have a page that big and put it a one pager, <laughs> to be fair, guys. But anyway, um, one of the things that you've said in your book is that solving climate change is the economic opportunity of our lifetimes and that saving the earth is now cheaper mm. than ruining it. Bold words. Um, would you care to elaborate? Maybe if I come to you, John, first. Surely. You know, the estimates are that we spend about $4 trillion a year on all energy and, and, 
consumption and energy related capital expenditures. And in this past year, if you look at the world about, about us, already in China, floods have cost $23 billion. In Europe, $30 billion. In the US, one hurricane, Ida, is estimated to have cost $94 billion. Now, you've got to ask the question, what is the social cost of these dirty, polluting activities? And uh, it probably amounts to $10 billion, $10 trillion, I should say. And, 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 and if the costs are that high and the returns are the great growth that we'll see from job creation, from improvements in health, you've got to ask how much more devastation are we going to need before we understand that, on a whole, it's cheaper to save the planet than to ruin it. And Brian, any further comments on that? Or oh well, I mean, the, the transition IEA and others say it's going to cost that four trillion. John said social costs cost ten, right? The social are all the things that come from pollution, the health, the destruction. But that four trillion that's spent, one of the things we try to make a case in the book for is it's not about finding new money. It's taking that existing money and channeling it towards the cleaner and greener alternatives. Yeah. And when those uh, greener alternatives become cheaper, right, and at cost competitiveness with their fossil fuel equivalent, it should be the natural choice. So redeploying capital with economics and technological trends Absolutely. driving that. But you, the, the point you make is such an important one about this aspect of climate justice as well, in that uh, I think the five countries most impacted by extreme weather back in 2019 were all in Africa. Mm -hmm the continent that collectively is responsible for less cumulative emissions than others. Um, and so that it really is important that we look at this both global, north, global, Sam. Yes. Um, Ryan, you mentioned the deploying capital, so I'd want to pick up on that. And yeah. the, so, you know, mobilizing the private capital in particular is going to be absolutely critical to achieving all these aims. And so what's your plan for making that happen? Yeah, uh, there are two speed and scale KRs. One is around the venture capital that needs to be deployed. Last year, there was something on the order of 16 to 20 billion that was deployed toward venture. That number needs to hit 50 billion, right, to really invest behind the companies that need to create the new technologies. There's another KR around project finance. I think we're capped out around 300 billion a year. That needs to be a trillion. And while it does sound like a large number, that is what's needed to shift our grid, right, to award clean energy is actually putting out the right solar and wind that we need. And so the way we get more is that solar and wind projects continue to create a great return. Ruth was on the, the show a little bit earlier and talking about how the green bond actually is a good return for the company. So that's how project finance accelerates. On the venture capital side, there's a hunger around these companies. Just in the past two years, you look at the public markets, Tesla, Sunrun, Enphase, Beyond Meat. These are examples of clear winners in the billion plus category. This is creating that momentum behind these new clean tech ventures. I think there was a, uh, a new report put out that said we're on track to doing some 30 plus billion this year. So we're, we're making pace, but let's get to that 50. There's two other key results in the investment front, one of which is to increase global government funding for clean energy from about $100 billion to $600 billion per year. And another growing, small today, but important category is philanthropic investing. So examples like the Bezos Earth Fund, which is $10 billion over a decade. That's a substantial increase, and we're seeing more commitments. Lorene Powell Jobs, for example, $3.5 billion to take on very risky, uh, potentially projects with no return, but yet great global good. So we're seeing the momentum across the entire financial ecosystem, and, and I completely agree. It's very exciting to see the additional flows going into philanthropic capital. I think Climate Works report earlier said that less than 2% mm -hmm. of foundational funding has historically gone into um, climate, as opposed to so some of the other social focus that they have. So again, the, mom the momentum on this, I really do think, is unstoppable. We're headed in the right direction, I think, with respect to all things climate. It's not enough. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, I, and I guess the key point about your 100 billion becoming 600 billion is the importance of leverage. Yes. Using that as catalytic de-risking capital to really crowd in that, that finance that we're seeing in the private sector too. Um, 
Which does bring me on to a question uh, for you, John, which is, all this is very encouraging, but how do we avoid creating a green bubble? I, we won't avoid creating a green bubble. And I'm from the school that says that bubbles are good throughout all of society. We've seen any major industrial transition, any technological advance be accompanied by bubbles. And I, I prefer to view them as booms. It, they lead to overinvestment. They lead to full employment. Uh, there'll be winners. There will be losers. But uh, we need a lot more capital. And we need capital wisely invested. But it all won't, all won't turn out quite that way. Wise words, indeed. Um, and then my final question to you both, I guess it's a question we're all being asked this week whilst we're here in, in Glasgow, but I particularly would like to ask you as veterans of venture capital, um, what are the main outcomes that you're looking for from COP26 and beyond? So I'll start, I'm sure Ryan will uh, conclude with uh, vigor. Uh, most importantly, I wanna see increased national commitments. The point is to up the ambition. Uh, af after that, I'd like to see broad adoption of methane goals, dealing not only with methane leaks, but the use of methane. Uh, I, I think that uh, we, we can reasonably expect more progress on deforestation, on ending the use of coal, and, and then my, my, my dream would get a sector-specific price on carbon so that there was more of at least a global framework to establish those kinds of markets. What would you add, Brian? Ooh, um, I would say I think the expectation from COP and beyond is to go for the gigatons, right? John's really you know, fond of saying ideas are easy, but execution's everything. And I think one of the messages we want to share in speed and scale with the world is you've got to set targets. You can't set ones in 2050, 60, beyond. It's really about the ones that you're setting for 2030, 2025, and even next year. And so if anyone is trying to take meaningful action towards this crisis, it's really about the goals they're setting right now, next year, and what they're doing there. That's where the points count. Thank you very much. John and Ryan, thank you for getting our conversation going this morning. Congratulations on your new book. We look forward to going through it in detail and hoping very much that we have a one-page solution to uh, solving the crisis and making sure that we channel capital towards a net zero economy. Thank you so much for joining Thank us you. this morning. What a great conversation.